Good evening and welcome to Behind the Headlines. My name is Timothy Nyangweso. This evening we look at the plight of the traders, especially looking at the standoff between government and the traders. Today is day two. Most of the districts, when we speak of Iganga, Mbale, some of them, their traders are off and nothing is happening. The ripple effect and the implications of this go farther than we can expect, especially if you look at transportation in the city, fuel, trade, anything that needs to happen to be bought. On normal circumstances, business would be buzzing downtown, but that's not what is happening now. The biggest standoff is on five issues that the traders are raising. One is IFRIS, two is valuation, three is the foreigners that are manufacturers that are within there. And they say if those three are dealt with, will be able to get into business. That's our discussion tonight, and you can be part of the show. Join us on YouTube, drop your comment there, or on our number below, 0709602562. That doubles both as our text line and our WhatsApp line. Let us know what you think. Our X platform for you to drop your comment, hashtag UBC behind the headlines. Let me introduce the panel because the energy is already here, but also the Commissioner General is also with us here. I'll start on my immediate left. Professor Sarah Sari, the Dean at the School of Women and Gender Studies at Macquarie University. Good evening. Good evening, Timothy. Good evening, viewers. Next to her is uh, making his maiden appearance here on the show, especially me hosting it, Mr. John Walugembe, who is the ED of the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Timothy, and it's a pleasure to join behind the headlines. Anytime we're discussing taxes and economics, we are pleasured by his presence here, Dr. Fred Muhumza, Director at the Economic Forum at MOVES. Good evening, sir. Good evening, our viewers, and Timothy, thanks for hosting us. And my fellow panelists, including the one you haven't introduced yet. <laughs> <laughs> because of the sequence of events. <laughs> the sequence of events delighted us to get him here. Uh, making his maiden appearance on the show, the Commissioner General of Uganda Revenue Authority, Mr. John Musinguzi Rujochi. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Timothy. Good evening, dear viewers. Thank you very much for all coming, and we really appreciate But I'll start on uh, a note that I'll pick from Doc, uh, Professor Sir. A headline that really made your ears really tingle in the last few days, uh, minus the traders. <laughs> yes, minus the traders. Of course, uh, there was a headline around the visit by His Excellency, the former president of the Republic of Tanzania, Chikwete, who were privileged to host him, and the, he talked a lot about East African integration. And I think that's very important because among one of the things he spoke, which relates with what we are speaking today, is uh, when do we have the economic cooperation, when do we have the integration, and he really talked about things like having similar taxations, similar policies, and of course he says right now they do have similar policies, but we need to have the economies integrated, uh, the sea preferential trade area, so that when goods enter one area, they don't have to pay the next. So while the traders were actually striking, the things he talked about on East African Federation, the economic, <coughs> the economic block and the, the preferential trade area were in a way related, but at a regional level. And of course, he thanked His Excellency the President of the Republic of Uganda for pushing for East African integration. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Holgembe, a headline for you that really caught your eye. Local, domestic. Both. Rather international. <laughs> Any, the one that caught you? Well, I think we are very much focused on the Middle East and the tensions between Israel and Iran. It could have a ripple effect, particularly on the cost of crude oil and so forth. That is something that uh, we are keenly following. Okay, interesting. Dr. Mumza, a headline that really caught your ear this week. I'm not sure whether it was a headline, maybe a sub-headline. Mm. The increment of salaries to the soldiers um, downwards, because there was an increment for the major and upwards. <coughs> now we have gone all the way. It has a lot of economic sense. I've been arguing for the Nabanja Fund. I like it when money goes to the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> so money, I know it will be requiring a lot of money, but it activates the economy that life comes back to that economy. And in economics, we say when you pay John, he will spend a little bit of that much increment you have given him. But when he increase down there, Warugembe is going to feel those guys mm. even before the sun sets. 
and then it trickles back from his business to the manufacturer. Life comes back to the economy. So bottom of the pyramid, I'm arguing for police to join them, prisons. Who knows those other teachers in primary schools who are not science teachers and secondary? Interesting. They send some money down there. Then John will get it back through consumption taxes. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mzinguzi, a headline that really caught your eye that you think really we need to hint on. Well, I think uh, yesterday's bold headline of the new vision was shocking to me. <laughs> it shocked me and, until I read the content. That's when I realized how, how far <laughs> headlines can be so far away from, from the truth. <coughs> But I, I hope that has been rectified. It, it was a misreporting that mm -hmm. employees are going to start paying 58%. Uh, that was so far from the truth. I, I, I also saw that one. And when yeah. it caught me, I said, I need to go and check. <laughs> I'm still safe. <laughs> but also, we want to pass on our condolences to uh, Dr. Martin Joram Alike, who passed on. And uh, tomorrow, there'll be a funeral service. And uh, our condolences go out to his family and loved ones a very distinguished man that leaves a very beautiful legacy for all of us to follow. And uh, our condolences go out to the family. Let's put some context to our discussion but that we allow have. me and Professor, Professor Sarah Sarah to add Professor Pierre Pell. Yes. Our former Deputy Vice Chancellor. Mm. Many of people will know him. Yeah. And of and course, the Nema Okrut. Yes. Nema yeah. Okrut. And also um, the wife of the former Vice President, Paolo Mwanga, passed on yesterday morning. The funeral program is yet to be uploaded. And our condolences go out to them, uh, <coughs> their loved ones and friends there. May the Lord strengthen them even in these times of trial. <coughs> Let's get into our discussion. Traders warned uh, the Commissioner General met them uh, sometime last month or earlier on this month. They had a few grievances to discuss, but some of them that have been discussed, especially their petition was taken to Parliament and also they met the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Trade, and they raised six <coughs> issues. VAT threshold, which is at 150 million percent, and they said that needs to be taken up to 1 billion. They also raised that VAT needs to be dropped from 18 percent to 16 percent. IFRIS needs to be restudied and be brought back to the traders. Import duty on fabrics, <coughs> especially garments, uh, $3 or $3.5 per kg or the 35 percent is too high, and they're saying it needs to be revised. The valuation guidelines need to be revised. They also talk about the anti-competition practices by manufacturers. They go on to also address issues in um, loss of Uganda's competitive competitiveness as a trade hub in the region, and they say people are going to Kenya and Tanzania there. A few recommendations made by the ministry, but they have asked for two weeks to be able to review these and more. It's no better way to start with the Commissioner General. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll start with one of the most basic questions that I was thinking about. How much do you know about your traders? Banks have KYC, know your customer. Uh, how much does the revenue know of its traders? And also, my second question that follows up is, how much does it cost to collect revenue by Uganda Revenue Authority? All right, thank you, Timothy. URA has also uh, stepped up our deliberate effort to know very well our taxpayers. For us, they are our clients, the way the banks <coughs> know their customers. So we value our clients, our taxpayers. We have made effort to reach out and to get to know them better, understand their challenges. But I must admit that uh, some of these initiatives are so recent and maybe the taxpayers are not so used to them so there is when we are repulsed for trying to get very close to know our taxpayers better. We think it's, it's very intrusive. But I honestly think that for us to work better, we must know each other better. So when you talk about the traders, I just did not meet them last month. I, I, I can count not less than 10 meetings with the different traders associations we have been meeting as often as there has been need. And for all these engagements, we have always come out with solutions. If you remember last year, Casita awarded us an award for being 
the most engaging government body. So there has been mutual, mutual interaction uh, for mutual benefit, and, and that has gone so well. Uh, but as you rightly highlighted in your opening remark, this time they had issues, which I also believe could have been handled through the engagement. Of course, they take different uh, times to, to solve. Some that are within our means, we've tried to solve. Others that need consultation, we asked for time. So last month when I met them, I was with the permanent secretary, secretary to the treasurer, and we went through these issues. And we clearly committed that what you want here requires further uh, consultations and engagement with other uh, leaders in government. So give us time. So what is a bit surprising is the impatience in this move. Because despite the civil engagements, despite understanding some of their challenges and resolving them, why the pressure now to demonstrate and to paralyze business? And I think that is, that is not yet clear to me, but maybe as we engage further and as members of the public also get to listen to us, they will tell that this time there is something beyond the, the ordinary pressures. So yes, we know our taxpayers, we engage them, we value them, we solve their problems because the, <coughs> the process uh, of taxation are, are quite, they can be quite detailed and, and, and involving. So we, we, it's to our benefit if we interact further and get to know each other. So uh, th that is one side. The other side, you said, how much does it cost to, 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 to collect revenue? Globally, they are recommended uh, ranges for tax administration cost. So tax administration to revenue collection should a healthy one should not exceed 5%. In other words, 5% of what you collect should be the maximum you spend on, cost, on, on the cost of tax administration. And I think for Uganda, uh, our range of what we collect is about 2.5%. About uh, so we are within the healthy range of what we spend on tax collection uh, because we are definitely below the highest that you should go. Anything between 2 and 5% would be a good uh, range of expenditure. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mumza, let me come to you. When you hear, because IFRIS is not a tax, and that needs to be made very clear, <laughs> it is a system that has been put in place to help with transaction and also receipting. Mm. So what is the standoff between the traders and government right now? Yeah, I think, as you said, it's not a tax. So that means uh, if the standoff is on IFRIS, then there is a need to educate the people on what IFRIS is. That's one side. On the second page, you come up with what are the implications. If this is not cost free, it, it, it requires some investment. Now, some people can manage that investment. We had it when digital stamps came. There was that debate on who covers the cost. But because at that point you're dealing with larger businesses, they can afford. So some people are raising the issue of the cost of compliance as an issue to them which also speaks to the threshold. Because if the threshold is 150 million, that means anybody who transacts 400,000 per day should be on VAT and IFRIS. Really, 400,000 is a woman by the roadside who sells 10 bunches of matoke. All those butchers you see, they can raise that money per day. So do we want them there? And I think that is where now the, the conversation comes in that we need to lift that so that some of the people who are complaining are left out of that, but we don't want to throw away IFRIS, because IFRIS is really needed to give John and also the traders to understand what is happening in the business, who collected the tax, because me, I pay the VAT, but some of this VAT never reaches the URA. It is also in my interest that the tax I paid actually reaches, but it should not benefit one party and not the other party. I think the other conversation I'm hearing is once John discovers them, because some of them, IFRIS has really exposed them. That's why they are resisting it. The guy tells you, I sell 4 million a day. Now, when he goes on IFRIS, he actually realizes he sells 15. Now, some are fearing it because of that exposure that is going to come out. But also, uh, once the exposure is out, others are saying, you are now going back and auditing us for 10 years and asking us to pay the arrears. 
we know we committed sins there, but surely those sins, if they are added to my current business, I'm going under. Mm. So to avoid all that, don't even bring a fresh. So there are so many things around it that uh, people are worried of that even those who understand the implications of IFRIS on their business going forward is what they are worried of most. And I think as John has indicated, some of these are policy to consult because once you have not paid taxes, the law empowers him to go back in time. To do that waiver is a minister's business. So th th that's where the conversations are coming in and we need to get in there. But IFRIS certainly, we need to move there, but the question is who should be on IFRIS? And once we discover how do we handle the future, because you want the future to be secured, uh, both of the taxpayer, but also of the country. So how do we make those, some of those uh, policy decisions that we need to, to be engaging? And uh, let, let's track back a bit. As you've said, they can track back a bit. Uh, for the last three years, because of COVID, no new taxes were put in place. Yeah. New taxes have come in place. What informs these new taxes? Is there a feasibility study that should inform, especially... I, I like what Mr. Algembe said in some forum and said, you know what, it has a ripple effect. It you does. wake up, the cement on all four concentrates, you, you're paying about 2000 on that. The water you're drinking, you're paying. The, the fuel you're using, you're paying. When you decide to go to a bar to drink something, you still pay. At the end of the day, you paid all. What feasibility <coughs> study informed these new taxes? Some of them really are not even new taxes. You have just revised the tax, like the 100 shillings on fuel. It's not a new tax. We haven't changed that tax, and the tax has been fixed for I don't know how many years, 10 almost, or five. So adding 100 shillings on a little of fuel is really the same old tax that you have just revised the rate. But what is informing the rate, the 100 shillings is really inconsequential. Uh, whom's are here, how much fuel do I spend per day? Maybe five liters? So 100 shillings is going to be 500 shillings per day added on me. Mm. I, I won't even feel it because I, I don't remember when I last kept a coin of 500 shillings. I always leave it with whoever is supposed to give me the change. So for most of the people who are going to pay this tax, they won't necessarily feel it. But if you consider that we are consuming about seven to seven and a half million liters a day, then it becomes some quite an amount of money that government can actually pay. Those are the things you want to consider. The person paying the tax, what cost is it imposing on them? And then the amount of money that's going to come out, what benefit can it do to the economy? So some of these taxes, people may, are just simply talking without necessarily saying, is it really a painful tax on me? How much did we add on, add on ground? Is it 500 shillings on a kilo? Mm. Really, some people have seen people buy cement of 800,000. Now, if we add, and this is a segment that people have not been using, the white cement and grout, not many people use it or buy large quantities of it. So if you add some 500 shillings, this person who is really spending uh, two million buying building materials may only be required to add another 5,000 or 10,000. He can't say that has disrupted my business. So some people sometimes, naturally, we all don't want to hear new taxes, but when we are doing our analysis, we say, what is the impact on the taxpayer? their business, and what is the benefit if this money comes out overall. So those are the kind of analysis that informed the, the decisions. And I think quite a number of taxes that have come through may not be that impactful in terms of disrupting business, but they have multiple benefits to the economy in terms of um, what else can we do to support the bottom of the pyramid. Now that goes to the other part, which we may not discuss today, on how are we spending the taxes. I think and there is some bitterness coming from that constituent as well. And we'll come back to that. Tax. I, I want to stay with the example you've said about, about fuel. Because the time 10 years ago, fuel was either 2, 9, or 3,000 there. Today, yes. it's 5,000 shillings. Yes. 100 shillings added to that is going deeper into my pocket. And the far reaching effect. Yes. A bag of cement was about 28,000. Today, it's about 33 to 35,000. Yep. So when I put that, I'm putting out more money out into these tax, yet what has informed the economy recovery for us to be able to ta get these taxes? Real as you said, fuel was 3,800 when the tax was where it was. Fuel to go to 5,400 is not because of tax. And we have absorbed that. It's because of the global uh, price of the barrel, the exchange rate.
the tax has still remained where it was and we have absorbed it. But also look at the realities of today. I see petrol stations, you pass one and you go to the next, they are next to each other. But the difference in fuel is 300 shillings. So 100 shillings that <laughs> the government is adding is not going to influence our decisions because already we have absorbed a gap of between 400 to 500 per litre on the different petrol stations. So nobody is going to say, this has so much grossly affected my income and revenues. I, I think it is still within an acceptable range mm. for a, at a personal level. And you imagine a bus going all the way to Aruan, you are going to use 200 litres. All they have added on you is really very little money for you to say, I now am going to increase the rate to Arua. Because of an increment of, is it about 2,000 or 20,000 on the whole bus journey mm. that is carrying 64 passengers, how are you going to dispute the 20,000 on the 64 passengers? You won't even find a change. So some of these taxes we estimate and say, the, 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 the provider, service provider will absorb it. You don't have to pass every tax on the other people. And some of these taxes, as we said, are going to be absorbed because of elasticities. I don't want to get into those economics. When you look at them in the analysis, you say, if anybody passes this small tax, he will be the one to lose. Both in terms of implementing the change you want to introduce to recover that money, you just absorb it and move on. It will be part of your profits. And you won't go out of business. That's the ultimate objective. So there's some kind of thinking that has informed most of these policies. Of course, there are other policies we are going to, taxes that we're going to do to debate, which might actually be disruptive of the entire ecosystem. And we can look at those later. But for now, I think quite a number of these taxes um, are within areas that will not disrupt the business at individual level, which is the micro, but also at the macro level, which is the bigger picture. But at the bigger picture, the benefit is much, much bigger than any inconvenience we may think we are putting on an individual. And that's what sometimes we look at. Thank you very much. Mr. Ogembe, let me come to you. Being in the small and medium enterprise there, uh, ever since COVID, economic growth has been one of the things they speak about. It was at 2.4%, 2.7, growing to 3, 5%. So it's between 3 and 5%. Yeah. But how much of this economic growth is taxable? Mm. And where do we find it? Mm. For me, uh, that wouldn't be my concern at the, to, to begin with. My concern would be that have businesses recovered from COVID to start with? Because you see, if I'm demanding a patient and they say he's admitted and is on drip, my interest is that this patient recovers. Eh? Because if I go and I find him on drip and I say, you give me my money, give me my money, give me my money, I'm, he may get a heart attack and just die. And then I've lost everything. So my interest is to ensure that this patient recovers so that he pays me fully. So as we discuss the issue of widening the tax base, we need to interrogate. Have businesses actually survived, or we are dealing with sick businesses, and we are simply squeezing, 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 and at some point we are going to see ish, that we are because the data from your itself is showing that you're seeing businesses paying less. So there's an understanding that there's a certain shrinkage. So for me, we have a task, and it's not just a task that you are has. As an economy, we need to increase our tax to GDP ratio. But how best do we do it without hurting businesses? And I think this is where our concern is. Businesses are concerned that the tax regime is extremely hard on them, and a few businesses that are bearing the burden. Okay, we are we are talking about, and, and I'll give you an illustration. Sometimes we even ta have taxes that are contradictory. I'll I'll talk about if we to begin with. If I want people to go online and use IFRIS to pay tax, then I want to make sure that I first begin by making sure that A, gadgets are available. So I remove every tax on uh, smartphones, on laptops, and so on, because what I want is uptake, isn't it? I remove tax on, um, on data, because I want to ensure that the constraint data does not become an additional constraint. See, But if I tax on this end, and also tax the other side, it becomes a bit of an issue. So if I'm promoting IFRIS, then it means I have to do away with all these digital taxes. If I'm saying I want to collect rental tax and I see it as a growth area, then I must ensure that I don't bring withholding tax on gains on tax on land because you are disincentivizing people to invest in real estate. 
So you have to run your numbers and say, am I going to make more money? It's like Facebook or all these platforms. If they charged us to register on Facebook, there would not be people there. But the guys determined that, okay, let people register for free, and then we just make money through adverts. So that's the calculation. And this is not, of course, you are, I can advise government as well to say, you cannot, you, if you organize an expo, you cannot charge the people entering and you also charge the sponsors. You can choose to say, let people enter for free, then you can get money through sponsorship. So that's what we are saying that as we come up with a tax regime, we must ensure that it is coherent and it is promoting a certain end. Now, I just want to comment on the issue of efforts because it's extremely important. It's clear that people don't know. You see a member of parliament coming. For us, you're opposed to this IFRIS tax. Eh? You find business leaders, this IFRIS tax is a problem. Already, that shows you that <laughs> you are a, <laughs> you are a as tax. You, you are a as task of educating people. That right there, there's a gap. Because how can you argue that there's a task? We are now negotiating over an IFRIS tax. It means already the negotiations are fault because you are starting from a wrong premise. See? So for me, I would say that biggest issue with IFRIS, in my view, are three things. One, people don't know what IFRIS is. IFRIS is a system, but they must also understand that behind it is a tax called VAT. See, it's a tax called VAT, and most people, it's the VAT that they are worried about, but they are using IFRIS as a, as a you know. So how do we ensure that we educate people on, eh, on IFRIS? which will take time because some this is illiterate. You're talking about digital literacy, you're talking about gadgets, you're talking about this. It will take time. Two, how do you educate people on VAT? Because the compliance cost for VAT is also high. You are talking about input tax, output tax, and so on. Some people, once you pay input tax, you say, you, you don't know that you can claim some of the money and then you pay the balance. Some people have been eating all the money and they feel they are going to lose it. So there are all kinds of elements there that you need to. Uh, demystify around around IFRIS. Now, the other issue that we also need to look at is the the method, and I think that is the biggest issue. And, and I, I want to come. How how is Mr. You, Gembe, yes. let, Let's come to the method later. Let yes. me ask. Yes. There is this whole Kujiriba. Yes. I have found you. I have, uh, doctors, uh, Professor Sarah wants something, but I don't have it in my shop. I run to your shop, pick it. Yes. But in between there. I am found as for an IFRIS receipt, and then I have to go and take you. But we why, have that why, why, economy that why, is there. Why, why, why is, why? Because if you, you know this is an informal economy that we're trying to formalize. And means of finance was saying, in fact, the biggest problem we have now is that the informal economy is actually growing. That is the, those are the statistics. Instead of reducing, it's growing. You find businesses that were previously formal choosing to become informal on purpose. Now, if I'm designing a tax measure, I must be cognizant, I must study. Eh? In business school, they told us, you go to Pemba. If I'm designing a tax measure, I go to Chikuva and I understand how do people operate before I come up with it. Now, if you have an enforcement regime where you just meet people, you bring your if receipt, you do this. I don't, for me, if I'm managing such a solution and I'm targeting people of that nature, I wouldn't make it that forceful. I would focus a lot on the education bit, on the carrot, on the incentives, and so on. I'll give, let me make a proposal here, which is wild. Government came up with 100 billion under the Small Business Recovery Fund. If you are a said, or if government said, for you to access funds under the Small Business Recovery Fund, you must uh, register. No, you may not say register, but you may put if free somewhere. There mm. must be if free something and so on. You may find that people are going, people are taking themselves there. They are not being pushed. Every time you push something, people will resist, even when it's for their good. You see, so I'm say, for, so for us. So this approach, which is rather confrontational with the traders and so on, needs to stop. We need to focus on education. We need to sit down with people. And then the other purpose I need to make is that we need to look at the logistics of it. People are going to have to pay data costs. There's this thing called the electronic fiscal device. Government should buy these devices and give them out to these traders for free. I cannot pay money 
me, I invest to pay you more tax. Eh? We must share the cost. If you want to pay more tax, you invest. You give me the devices. I don't know how many that devices you are purchased and gave out, but there were few. Number three, <coughs> we have a lot of graduates who have started BCOM, ICT, and they are idle. Well, I should set up. I saw in the concession they said they are just going to set up one center in Chukubu. That center is not enough. Business goes beyond because just because traders in Chukubu are rioting does not mean that other business people are happy with what's taking place. So, the solution should be comprehensive and nationwide. URA should come up with hubs and centers that support businesses that want to file returns that have issues and so on and so forth. We shouldn't create this if this thing is just creating more business for consultants and accountants. And so. It's not a bad thing. But why should that cost be borne by the business? So my proposal is these young people can be trained by URA. Not enforcers, because I saw in their budget they are going to recruit more enforcers. The challenge with that is that you are assuming that people are hiding money on purpose and want. Yes, there are those elements, but why don't we focus on helping them? Why don't we assume that they don't know and want to handhold them? So I would propose that Makerere, Madam, Professor, the lot of young people are graduating. Let us have an MOU between you and yourself train them in how to use IFRIS and so on. Then do, deploy those young people to support those entrepreneurs. Some of them may be opposing things because of lack of knowledge. As I've mentioned, if someone comes and says IFRIS is a tax, after people have several said it's not, it means that they need to be supported and trained to ensure that they understand, or they need to delegate that to younger people who can help them to file the receipts and, and, and so on. So Thank that's my... Thank you very much. Uh, Professor, when you hear the pain points of the traders, are they valid? And this strike, is it sustainable? Thank you, Timothy. Uh, I'm not sure about the sustainability of the strike because I think in the long run it may not be sustainable. Again, because of the nature of our economy, yeah. that the traders need to be open to survive, they themselves. Okay? So if they close shop for a long time, their earnings are going to suffer, their homes are going to suffer, and they also, there are many things they need to do in order to, they need to help keep their shops open to survive. Because we are an economy which doesn't have a welfare state, so you survive according to how much you work. But whether their things are valid, their complaints are valid, of course the members have already submitted on IFRIS and uh, the system, and of course we need a lot of tax education. And maybe just to comment on Makere should do more. I know I have a colleague in the School of Law, Dr. Diana, <laughs> she, <laughs> Dr. Diana Atenyi. I know she has had cases where she has taken her students, for example, to Wandegea, to help the small earning women there, to open accounts and have teen numbers. It's mm. not IFRIS, but it's just as simple as that. Yeah. So as you say, university mm. students can mm. do that. Because mm. in Macaria, the School of Law, one person has shown that actually that can work, mm. just okay. with the registration to get a teen number. Some of the people who are complaining, if they're big traders like Casita, they have teen numbers. B and I know they're the ones who are being targeted. But also, if we're talking about expanding the tax threshold and we want everybody on board, it's important that this tax education goes all the way down. So to go back to the strike, right now it's going to hurt the economy, it's going to hurt the earnings that would have been taxed on a daily. But I think in the long run there will be a problem because as their savings get depleted, they need to find means of survival. But their return should not be celebrated. If, yes, if at all nothing happens and they still return, that should not necessarily be celebrated as victory over them. And we have cowed them to come. Because people who return out of despair, then engage in more strategies which make it more, they go covert instead of overt. Right now the strike is overt. They are saying mm. we are not opening because we are not happy with one, two, three. But if we let them to drag on, after all they are the ones to suffer. Mm. In two weeks they will come back. But their strategies now will go more covert. Okay? And then we shall have these skirmishes which may not be very, very nice. The other thing is for us to understand what they are challenges and whether their complaints are genuine. I think there are two things we need to factor in. There's a question you asked as the third, I don't know whether we shall come to it later, the whole issue of foreign industrialists. Mm. 
Now, you talked about foreign industrialists, but I'm now talking about foreign traders within that. Yeah. Try to go downtown to buy a gadget. Between a Ugandan trader and a foreign trader will be at least, a, and I mean good quality gadgets that are branded. Between a Ugandan trader and a foreign trader will be a difference of around 500,000 or 600,000. And we are all largely small time earners. We are salaried all. We shall go where the price is cheap. In as much as we are patriotic, Mm. And we are ideologically oriented, we are very nationalistic. If uh, you're going to buy a smartwatch or you're going to buy a smartphone, and for the same brand, the difference on the same street is that big, you will definitely go it's cheaper. Okay? So maybe some of the complaints on your third point are coming from that seeing that some people maybe are not paying as much, and here is where the details will come, but if you see that some people are not paying as much and you're paying more and you think for you, you belong to the country, and others are passing through and you're talking, then questions become of who should the government be caring for more? Is it us who are going to stay here longer <coughs> or those that are passing through? Of course, now there are also these other, I, I know some of it has been misinformation or disinformation or the 58 percent but also there's this question on tax upon tax i know yesterday we saw someone who was explaining how they and this was a trader from outside kampala how they pay the tax i think at some point but when they go the further they go into the farming sector the more you have other enforcers putting on other things along the way so that also can create a challenge but i think the second point why their concerns may be legitimate. At the end of the day, the question is, what are the rewards? You know, we just have sanctions all through. Mm. But what are the rewards for compliance? Of course, there's always this assumption that people have hidden. So if a system comes, first of all, the system should be celebrated because a system would help us to comply better. Mm. Taxation is based on documentation. Mm -hmm. And appropriate valuation of a tax is based on accurate information. So I imagine if the tax enforcer came and said, what have you been doing in the last, and you show your sales as they were per the day and not estimates, the valuation would be better. But also you have a case and you, we've had complaints where even when people have that in order, the assumption is that they are hiding something. So the suspicion makes a person be sometimes taxed more than they would be. So that can be a problem. But also the other thing is, okay, so if we comply, what are the benefits? Should we already just talk sanctions, sanctions, sanctions? What are the benefits? And that's, so, uh, th that's where Professor wanted to come to you. Because when you drive on some of the roads, when you go to a hospital, and this is the underlying of yes. this standoff, they're asking themselves at the back of their heads, <coughs> I pay taxes, where are the services? How do we link the two, especially because even in their six mm. requests here, that one is still also a bottom line. Even when you walk on the streets, you'll hear people saying, we pay, but where are the services? How do we link the two? I think the two can be linked. And actually, before we come to we pay and where is the service, is the question of how much of my effort should the state have a claim on, OK? Mm. OK, I know this question gets asked more in the US and in more developed economies. OK, that if I make 1 million, you have a claim on 300,000. So if I go further to a billion, how much of that should you have a claim on? So fundamentally, there's this whole thing that this is my effort, this is my money, this is my sweat. How much of that should you have a claim on? And the second question is, for what purpose? Okay? And it is unfortunate that what you are always trying to do to streamline is running alongside, in the same time, coincidentally, with perceptions of waste. Okay? So that is going to make you have an uphill task, however well-intentioned their issues are. So one, how much of my revenue or my effort should the state have a claim on? And two, for what purpose? And that comes to the question of services. Uh, if that happened and people are getting the service and they're getting the roads and uh, largely if people are even, for example, given tax holidays in case they are going to create jobs, but you see, the level of unemployment is so high. Everyone who is working, or every trade, everyone who is earning is having a very de big dependency burden. And then with that, the services are not clear. And the perception that we are raising money, you are is increasing money so that other people can finance their lavish expenditure, their lavish lifestyle. I think.
that becomes the problem. If these two had not come together, I think you are, I would have had a better, a, a, an easier task explaining. But it's coming at the same time with perceptions of lavish expenditure, which are legitimate, by the way, by the Public Finance Management Act. But you see the person is saying it doesn't have a service and there are reports of so, so, so much waste of other people are living overboard. That becomes unfair. But I think, in essence, also again, this is where you need more information. Sometimes the services are there, but the problem is that the information is not there. For example, there are essential services that the government tries to produce to provide. There's a basic amount of education. If you want more than that, go beyond. You, you top up. There are basics that they import in terms of health care. I know, I know the people on this panel will not appreciate having a free Panadol, having free antimalarials, having free. Okay, because we go to high-end facilities. But there are people in communities where the government health facility is the only provider. And of course, most of the complaints are around big cities. Sometimes the beneficiaries of these basic, seemingly cheap services are further away, and they are not in the tax bracket. So somehow, money has to be found, because they're also citizens. So they should be given some basic. So. The perception of lack of services is because we want a particular kind of service, and indeed we should have it. We should aspire to it. Then the state will do better. But that does not necessarily mean there's not much that is going in. Some is going in, but it's going to areas we don't see. And here you need to look at the local health centers. Is it three? Health center threes, health center fours. Those are areas which we don't go to, but the state has to put in some money to run. The roads in rural areas, there, there's basic infrastructure supporting the local government system where people are not paying as much tax Is that. So unfortunately, the cities have fewer people engaged in business, and sometimes they have to pay higher for that. I think that goes back to what my, the previous speaker has spoken, that we need to devise strategies to make the economy not to contract, but to expand it. Then there we can have more people paying tax or complying with the tax, and so we have more revenue. But the more we engage in strategies that even bring down the few who are in the business, then we shall even have more fewer people. Then you have a contracting economy. We shall all have to be civil servants to survive. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. I hope we don't get to that point. Uh, some things, I, I saw you writing, and I know there are some you want to respond to. But uh, please add this one. I, I had the opportunity to move around the city last week uh, to see what is happening. But the militarization of enforcement, why not the police, why the military? I was on Kampala Road. What was the jam that was caused there was an enforcer and a military person with a weapon. The psychological effect of this, and also why militarize the enforcement of collection of revenue? OK. Th thank you very much, uh, Timothy. And thank you, uh, colleagues, members of the panel. I, I, I realize that maybe I should have spent a little more time in explaining some of these issues uh, because a lot of information is definitely not yet available to the public. So you allow me to spend a little more time in defining some of the basic concepts. Let me start with VAT, value added tax. This tax has been around since 1996 or thereabout. Seven. Yes, Nine, 96, 97. However, very few members of the public understand how VAT works. VAT is an indirect tax. It is not necessarily coming from the person paying it. Many times the people paying that tax are agents of government they collect it from somebody else. So finally, VAT is paid by the consumer. Mm -hmm. It is a consumption tax. It is paid by the consumer. It could be an individual. It could be a business. But the one who is not going to resell this product is the one who will pay VAT on it. Dr. Fred rightly said the threshold is at 150 million Uganda shillings per annum. On average, you'd need to make sales of about 110,000 per day. Now, despite the threshold being that low, 
we only have 33,000 taxpayers registered for VAT. Because again, tax payment, tax registration is first and foremost based on voluntary compliance. So Uganda Revenue Authority does not know how much you make in your daily sales. It is your matter. It is up to you to say, eh, I sell more than 500,000 per day. I'm above this threshold. Let me register for VAT and be one of those citizens who will help government to collect this tax. Not that I'm going to pay it, but I'm going to collect it. And this is how it works. Whatever purchase you make, be it an importation, be it a purchase from a factory here, to put in your shop to sell, or to put in your business to resell, you will pay on it VAT 18%. And if you notice, if you read your receipts, they will always talk to the items first, because some items are not vatable. And out of the value of the total items purchased, they will get their total sales number, figure. They will subject that to 18%, and then they will give you the final payable amount. Mm -hmm. That clearly tells you that VAT is not your money. You are collecting it on behalf of government. So when you purchase, you pay VAT. When you sell what you have purchased, you had bought items worth one million. After adding on all your costs, the value has now gone to two million. Then the 18% on two million, you will charge it from the person coming to buy from you this item. And what you will pay to Uganda Revenue Authority is the difference between the 18% on 2 million base, which you have created after adding value, minus the 18% paid when you are buying these items, and that difference is what you give URA. Therefore, the net effect is you, the trader, you have not paid VAT. You have passed it on to the next person who has bought from you. The next person, if he's going to resell, he will pass it on to the next. Finally, the final consumer who buys this tea or this water to drink it will be the one to incur that cost. So why should it be that we have 33,000 taxpayers above a threshold of 410,000 sales per day in a population of almost 50 million people? in an active population of about 10 million people in business or earning or playing an activity in the, economic, uh, in the economy of Uganda. So that tells you that our degree of voluntary compliance has been quite low. And also our knowledge of these concepts has been quite low. So I agree there is need for more engagement. And we are ready to do that. And we have already been doing that. We just take it to a higher level. So therefore, to sort out some of these challenges of low compliance, low voluntary compliance, we introduced technologies. IFRIS is one of the technologies introduced by URA in 2019. 2019, IFRIS, which is now a platform to help you um, as a taxpayer, to keep accurate records of your sales. It's not a new tax by all means, but if you don't have a sales package in your business, you can use IFRIS. It will sort out all your stocks, all your purchases, all your sales. So it is a fully fledged account sales technology or software for you to use. Number two, we have been complaining about being overseased. URA is overassessing us, and, and Professor Sarah has said, sometimes we suspect that your sales are more than what you have declared. Yes, because there is no transparent means to tell us. And yes, because a number of people are indeed suppressing their sales. So this technology will take away the complaints of URA is overtaxing us. Because whatever business transaction you handle in your business, it will come to our URA system, we will Acknowledge it, that is the process we call fiscalization, and we will uh, give it a name or give it a unique number that this transaction has happened worth this amount and this is the VAT collectible. And then for you, at the end 
of the month. You'll just click a button and you see, oh, these are the sales I've made in a month. Because VAT is payable every month. So you must file a return before the 15th of the following month. So now this technology will help you file that return easily. In fact, instead of creating more jobs, IFRIS is going to take away some jobs because a lot of people had to rely on a tax agent to come and file for them because uploading your sales, entering them in an Excel sheet, then uploading it has been a very tedious process. And yes, some business owners can't do that on their own. They hire people to do that. But with IFRIS, as long as we have installed this technology on your platform, and it can be a phone, I'll come to that later. It can be your computer. The rest of the work will happen without your involvement. The way we use these phones to make calls and call America and wherever, the use of the phone does not have to know the technology that connects me to someone in America. That one was done by technology and it was sorted. So the same with IFRIS. Sell your goods through IFRIS, sell, enter your purchases in IFRIS, it will tell you the right tax you should be paying at the end of the period by just clicking the button. So there is that benefit. File the automatic, automatically filled returns to URA at the end of the period. If your VAT input is more than the VAT output, and this can happen, you may buy goods worth 100 million, you may collect VAT uh, on those goods, which should be like uh, 20 or so million, but you may have an input VAT related to this business, which takes down the VAT output, and therefore you're entitled to a refund. For people who have been complaining that URA never pays refunds, it takes forever. Now refunding will almost be instant, because the data that we use to assess and know that you're entitled to a refund is already with us. We were receiving it in advance. So people who have been inconvenienced by delays in refunds, that will be sorted. The other benefit is for the business environment, there will be fair competition. And again, I think it was Professor Sarah who hinted on it. Why should one shop sell its products more expensively than the other? When the source is the same, the products are the same, most likely it is the element of tax. The one who does not pay tax will undersell, will undercut those who pay tax. And they can afford to sell at a price lower. And of course, they will have a higher turnover. But then it means the ones who have been compliant are suffering, and they will soon run out of business, or they will join non-compliance. So the technology called IFRIS is an equalizer. It gives businesses an opportunity for fair competition. It will help them keep clear records even protect them from theft. One of the challenges people suffer in businesses is theft. You get out, you leave an attendant. What they sell, you don't know. But put a rule and say you should never sell anything without using IFRIS. How will they sell and you don't know? So there are many benefits. We are explaining this. So from 2019 when IFRIS was acquired, of course there was lockdown 2020, so we could not do much. 2021, we resumed deployment of IFRIS. And it has been handled very systematically by engaging, by educating. So we started with the big players, manufacturers. These ones already had their own sales systems. All we needed to do was to bring IFRIS interface with theirs and we integrate the two systems. And that worked well. 2022, we went into other big players, distributors, supermarkets. Again, it was not without resistance. Some resisted because they didn't know. Others, the degree of transparency is too high. They don't feel comfortable with it. But with time, they came down. And we agreed we must work together. I think one of the groups took us to court. And the court ruled, no, you cannot stop such a good system because of these concerns. So after that, we settled. Now the big boys are on IFRIS. But what is happening? When you deploy IFRIS very well, among the big boys, the supermarkets and others, and you don't deploy it in Chikubo, where they buy from, then the customers shift because we have a price-sensitive community. Even if your price is just 1,000 below mine, I can walk a kilometer to go and save that 1,000. So business has been shifting to the areas where there is no IFRIS. 
and it is becoming a disincentive for those who are on IFRIS to stay there. So last year, we engaged downtown business. First, by educating. There has been a permanent tax education team in central business area educating people in IFRIS. Mr. Msinguzi, and I'm glad you're talking about IFRIS. Mr. Holgenby raised something about <laughs> devices, technology. I'm coming to it. Just a minute. I'm coming there, Timothy. So we started the engagement and education. We wanted to roll out and start enforcement. Because when the law is out and you have engaged, and people still not choose to comply, the next is enforcement. We could have started enforcement last year, in November. But when we were starting, again, there was a lot of noise. It didn't get outside so much to the public because we moved fast and spoke. But personally, I was in Chikuba. I spoke to all those traders. And we agreed, OK, if you've not had enough engagement, this team will be here with you until you know enough. And they've been there from November last year to the present. They, on a daily, they record how many people they have engaged. I have 20,000 taxpayers engaged by this team by way of name and shop number. Educating. But the truth be told, sometimes even when you are sensitized on something that is going to, to expose you to an extent that you're not comfortable, you can still find ignorance. And this is why we are saying, OK, now let's have even a business support center, not to collect tax, but handhold those who are there. So therefore, mm. the demand should not be get out of here. Because if I get out of here, how will you know? Mm. The demand should not be stop if freeze. If we stop or freeze, then when will you know it? Mm. The discussion should be, let's sit together and learn more. Mm. Let's go slow, maybe on some of the penalties. Mm. Give us an allowance to understand. And this would be legitimate. But do those things call for a strike? No. So now let me talk about the channels. IFRIS can be used through system to system integration. I already mentioned that. It can be used over the internet. Just go on the web and uh, access our IFRIS portal, and you enter your sales there. But you see, going through the internet, it is most suitable for people with few sales. It's not suitable for Chikubo. Now, when we went down to downtown, we brought the EFD, the electronic fiscal device machine. It was costing $100. And we had a sample of these machines, so about 400. We gave them out for free so that we have people who will pilot this and tell others this is a good system. But even to our surprise, even those that we gave out are not being used today. About 10% of what we gave out for free is being used. The rest is not. So we had to think hard. We said, OK. Let's lower this cost of using IFRIS. So we went and developed a mobile app. The mobile app, <coughs> excuse me, the, the mobile app can go on your mobile phone and you will generate an e receipt. If the taxpayer buying from you is using a phone, you can send it to him. If not, you can print it off a small printer. The printers that we use for IFRIS, I mean, these small printers they call thermal printer. The cost of a thermal printer is 100,000 or at most 150,000. So really, we are talking about VAT registered taxpayers using IFRIS. IFRIS is not yet for everybody. The gazetted users are VAT registered. The assumption is that you are making a certain volume of sales. With that level of sales, we think the cost of 150,000 for a thermal printer can be accommodated, and it's a one-off cost. So we have tried on our side to lower the cost of doing of collecting this business. But the truth is, the transparency that it brings can be quite, uh, uh, can be quite uh, a pain for mm. the one who has been hiding this. And I will give you some examples without mentioning names. There are businesses in central business where we have deployed IFRIS in these recent days when they are making noise and they want us out. And the degree of under declaration for those that have been claiming uh, one of the businesses is a restaurant, they've been claiming that their sales is about one million every day. And guess what? With IFRIS, they are selling about 10 million every day. Wow. So the level of declaration is 10%. There are some landlords who have been declaring to us that we are renting this small room for 200,000. And guess what? They are charging 2 million. So how do you think such a person will be happy with an IFRIS technology that transparently shows this? 
And if they are not bold enough to come through, because it would be unreasonable to resist technology because it has shown what you've been under declaring, then use some of the small elements to make the noise. Because honestly, most of the businesses down there who are complaining, they are not on the VAT register, they are not paying VAT, they are not supposed to use IFRIS. <laughs> but there is some pressure that says, no, make the noise. I've told you we have been engaging, we've been resolving. What is the crisis that caught, cuts down now engagement and communication over IFRIS? Okay, uh, allow us to take a quick break, but let me first read some feedback that has come through here. Uh, good evening, Timothy. This is to Sime from Chigo. Uh, to the URACG, I would like to know to which extent our taxes and systems li are likely to translate into major local languages for ease of understanding, okay? Uh, that's one to local languages. This is Maxine Jamil Atuki from Koboko. My view is that Uganda should make policies which encourage citizens to create businesses that encourage employment rather than businesses which cannot last for long periods, okay? Uh, why is we're here? Uh, although URA has met the obligation, the problem is that the only center at one point, which is the collection point and chasing people around, okay? Uh, what is the main target of this system? How can, it, how can a middleman or a broker avoid taxes? <laughs> I don't think that's <laughs> where you want to go. <laughs> uh, hello, Timothy. This is Rushenyi from Fort Porto. My question goes to the Commissioner General. Is URA worried about the traders and the local investors closing for a week or a month due to double taxation? To me, I suggest that URA, before introducing a new tax, they should first educate the traders and any other party about the benefits to the implications towards the future of the business and to make it sustainable. Lastly, uh, someone here said uh, something about the business, and I need to be able to read it. He talked about uh, the business that if he's a broker and he's buying something at 500 and selling it at 550, that we had talked about. Him as a broker, where does he fall in that? So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back from this break, we'll be answering questions in valuation and, you know, import duty there, and then we'll spread our wings further to discuss how do we make this, turn it around to be positive, that taxation is compliance to all of us. This and more after this break. Fred! Just my sis. Freddy, Freddy! <laughs> Fred Dola, my boss, CEO of Inojo, the general of generals, the conqueror of conquerors, the first and the final, the sky, the promised land, the terms and the conditions, the international king crocodile, the source of the source What's of the sis? Nile. I don't have money today. <laughs> Just take a polite loan of 200 you get to stock on my shop. The signs and symptoms of success. The bank commander, not the bank tailor. Why hassle for a loan when you've got MTN Momo? We're so tingy. Use the Momo app or dial star 165 star 5 hash for all quick loans. Choose from the different loan options from our partners and get one that works for you. Together, we're unstoppable. The Government of Uganda and the Uganda Bureau of Statistics is calling upon all stakeholders such as the Chief Administrative Officers, City Mayors, Resident City Commissioners, City Clerks, City and Division Councillors, Wards and LC Chairpersons, as well as the residents and business communities to cooperate with the UBOS field teams as we embark on advanced preparations to conduct the national and housing census on the 10th of May 2024. The census will be a 10-day exercise to obtain statistical data and information that will be used for planning and policy formulation, including information on 1. How many we are, 2. Where we are, 3. How we are living, 4. What we own, and 5. Where we access services from. The Uganda Bureau of Statistics has now started listing of households and mapping in the 11 cities Arua, Fort Porto, Gulu, Hoima, Jinja, Lira, Mbale, Masaka, Mbarara, Soroti, and in the Greater Kampala, comprising of Kampala, Wakiso, and Mukono districts. For more information, please call 0755 342 128 or 0773 
342128. This message is brought to you by the Executive Director and Census Commissioner, Uganda Bureau of Statistics. Census 2024. It matters to be counted. Nyati Motion Pictures brings you Toko Pamoja Toro segment. Follow the romantic tale of an adventurous prince, Kaboyo Kasusun Kwanzi, who fell in love with a beautiful county. Toro Kingdom was carved out of Bonyoro Kital. In 1830, King Nyamutukura. Akasindika Omutabani Uwe. Kaboyo Yehile Toro, Kamoa Tongeriku Mutuwekele Vukod. I'm forming my own kingdom. Nyoro Naba Toro, basically, Muntuomu. Tuko Pamoja, daily screenings at Ham Cinemax in Wandegea, Sunday 7th to 13th, April 2024. To get a ticket, call 0778 787 660. Welcome back from that quick commercial break here on Behind the Headlines. My name is Timothy so I'm joined by Professor Sarah Sali, Mr. Walugembe, Dr. Fred Muhumza, and the Commissioner General of URA, Mr. John Musingu Zirujoki. A lot of messages coming through, uh, so let me just read two because uh, they're so pertinent. Someone says, uh, Timothy, uh, please ask the Commissioner General that for individual teens, it is becoming difficult. Along the way, the network jams. I even went ahead to post it, but I did not get any help. I had to go to a URA agent to instead, who told me it would take three days, that if I want an instant teen generated, I have to visit URA. I did and was successful. So how do we fix such network jams when they happen? Okay, let me come back to you, Mr. Msinguzi. Uh, two things that were raised in here that I need uh, for you to be able to That's respond nice. to. One yeah. is uh, the military enforcement. Mm. Two is the difference in standardization of valuation. Mm. And then uh, the third one is really within your docket, mm. the increment of the garments there, the taxation in the garments there, okay. justification on why these have happened are some of the concerns raised here. Okay, thank you, Timothy. Now on the militarization, you give your own example of what you witnessed last week. I'm sure the military presence you saw on the streets was in response to the threats to strike. Because this is what happens. When people are trying to strike, especially for a cause not well stipulated, the methods they use, some of the agents who try to sponsor such a strike, is that if you open, we shall ban your shop. So there was that fear among the traders. A number of them are on IFRIS. They have no issue to strike. A number of them are saying we've been engaging with government, we will get solutions. Even in the last meeting, we were promised solutions to come by the end of the month of April. The plans to strike started at the beginning of April. So there was a lot of reason for people not to strike. However, the sponsors, in order to achieve this, they sent out threatening messages. And of course, now that is a security matter. It's not a URA matter. So in response, the army and the police had to deploy to calm down the fears. And you saw one day there was, no, shops were closed, another one, people opened. Even the first day, people were outside waiting, not sure. So I think the military presence you are referring to has been to assure security for uh, the traders to make sure no one is hurt or intimidated by the people who are trying to sponsor this strike. That's but true. number two. That's true. The yes. one I witnessed on Kampala Road yes. was a URA staff uh, with a soldier. I'm coming to that. Also, when you are a staff are doing their work, they are not free of the risk of being attacked by those who don't want this work. However good and noble it is, some people still see it as a problem. So on a number of occasions, we've had our staff attacked. I could even give examples that on this day, our staff were attacked by this person. I have that data. So for that reason, when we send out our staff on an enforcement operation, on an anti-smuggling operation, part of the tax leakage is through smuggling, we have to send them with security for their own protection. But it's normally a soldier or two going with a team of many tax collectors. So yes, URA has a number of military people, both from the UPDF and the Uganda police, just to provide protection to our staff and to deal with the extreme activities of tax evasion, like smuggling, 
and threats on their lives. So we have our own staff, but that team is very small. I was on one of the talk shows recently and someone alleged we had 3,000. Far from it, the total number of security we have to, inf to, to, to back up operation is about 500, 200 and 250. So that is the other level of security that you could have seen. When we are enforcing IFRIS on the supermarkets, again, we used to send our enforcement teams and they would go with one or two soldiers just mm. to make sure that they are not attacked. And these are soldiers who will stand at a distance and only come in to intervene when there is threat on our staff. So there is no militarization of tax education, I mean of tax collection. Tax collection is again largely based on voluntary compliance, but for extreme uh, elements who are not willing to be compliant and who want to threaten our staff, then they must be secured. Now let me speak about the second question, which is on valuation. Uh, for, for the international trade taxes or customs taxes, there are principles that guide us on how to value the imports. One is going by the importer's declarations. And this one, it's normally your invoice, it is normally your bill of lading, it is normally your bank transfers, and so on and so forth. Using that kind of information, we confirm that this is the true value of the goods you have imported. But what happens? Some elements, again, not all importers, have decided instead of submitting the real invoices, they go to NASA. That's where they print the documents. NASA wrote, and they create their own invoices. And many times these invoices are much lower than the true value of goods. So in the absence of a true invoice, then we use the database values. Now these database values are based on research because we conduct research on the cost of items here, we conduct research on the sources of goods, and we come up with a fair estimate of a value. Now what URA has embarked on in the last one year is to publicize this database so that by the time you go to import, you know that the shirt I'm going to bring is valued at about $2. Now, about six, six months ago, some taxpayers were complaining that our database values were very low. And others were saying these are the right ones. So I commissioned a joint research. I said, you traders, each one of you select one, one, one person. I will attach my one or two people go outside there and we do a joint research. We can go to m major places where we shop from. Let's go to China and see the cost of goods. Let's go to Turkey and see the cost of goods. Let's go here in East Africa and see the cost of goods. And we come and we make a joint report. The day we commissioned that team, that is where the disagreement started. The traders who are saying these values are too high, they said, ah, Sija, Sija, I will not clop, I will not put a rope around my own neck. I'm not going into that research. Why? It is true that we have also been in a, an era of using very low values that are not backed up by research. Okay. And when the research happens, it shows the true value, which may be higher than what we are used to. So we will continue to improve the declaration of values, make them transparent so that people know. But we must also shift from a mentality of using lower values from NASA and use the true values. Now, the particular complaint on textiles is, again, a matter of the law. In the law, we have a specific rate for textiles and garments. And this is $3 and $3.5 per kilogram. Now, that was a deliberate law passed by government to protect and encourage the young industry here of textiles because we have the best cotton in the whole world. If we allow the investment in cotton here, we can produce the best cotton products and we'll get 10 times more the value that we get when we export raw cotton. That is a very deliberate policy of government. Import substitution and promoting manufacturing in our country. For that, there is a price to pay. So for that reason, a high tax was put on textiles and garments. Okay. So, the only thing we should do if we want that change is through engagement. It's through change of policy. It cannot be through this striking. Okay. And Thank maybe you. the last point mm. I, I need to mention is Kuyiruba. You've talked about Kuyiruba. Kuyiruba is a common word for, you know, 
people who buy, fr who get from one shop to another to go and say, of course, it's not one of the best practices because me as a shopper, when I go, I want to buy from you. If you don't have, you should tell me, go to the next shop. However, as inconveniencing as it is to the shopper or the person doing the shopping, it is a culture in our business community here. And we have assured them that for movement of goods within a limited business area like Chukubo, we will not be asking for a receipt from one person to the other within the environment. But our enforcement people could be standing at the gate so that by the time you come out, you should have a, a receipt for where you have bought. And we want to encourage taxpayers, even if you are not on IFRIS to use VAT, uh, you are not on VAT and you're not using IFRIS, at least issue a proper receipt with your name and address and contact. So that when I see your receipt, I know it is from this taxpayer who is not necessarily on, on, on VAT. So the Kuyiruba issue can be accommodated even with IFRIS. That's the point I'm trying to make. Thank Dr. You. Mumza, taxes and change are inevitable, however much we feel like we have a challenge with them. How do we widen this tax base that it has? Uh, Mr. Olgembe spoke and said the informal sector is growing daily. But how do we bring in everyone into this tax base? That Adam Smith, as he said, it's fair, it's convenient, but it's equitable, that everyone shares this burden. How do we get there? It's really complex. One of the ways we would get there is, um, we seem to already be there in a sense, except that there are people who are charging taxes and not passing them on. And we have that problem with people feeling that there are so many people who are not paying taxes. No, the taxpayers are paying, but the tax collectors are not remitting the tax to URA. And I think that's what John's every system is trying to resolve. Can we come clean? Because people will say only so f very few people are paying the tax. Every time I ride on a border border, I drive a car, I've paid fuel tax. Could that border border person passes on the fuel tax to the people he's carrying? So ultimately, it is the rider, the, the people being ridden on that border border who are paying that tax because the border border person has added it to that 2,000 or 3,000 that they have charged in there. So understanding that dynamic should help us to know where is the problem, because the tax is already broadened out there in that kind of uh, thinking. But also it goes back to the question of who should I expect to have charged the VAT? And I think that's why sometimes the enforcement people are getting a problem. You go downtown and you find uh, hardware, deep in the Kamocha, deep wherever, and you say, where is the VAT? Now, this person bought a bag of cement at 35000 from town here, transported it all the way to Boyo Giri, and has a small hardware there. He has added on 2000 This person, in adding the 2000 did not add VAT, because he doesn't understand those dynamics. For him, he has only added on his cost of moving the cement mm. from here in railway yard to where you're getting it. Added on his cost of the rent that he's paying, plus his profit of maybe 300. That's why he added the 2,000. But he also knows if he adds anything more, he will not save. So to go now and begin to ask this guy of the hardware to pay VAT, which he never actually added, becomes a problem. Because now he will feel, which tax are you asking me? Now, others in industrial area, here at the railway yard, for them, they know what to do. They will say, I bought from him at this much. I've got it here. Now I can add this is my cost. This is now VAT. Now, that is where part of the education needs to come in for both parties. The traders, because some of them are actually behaving like final consumers. They can't add VAT because there is no margin left on the price that me and you know, which is the bag of cement. Mm which is the newspaper price. At that point, there is no VAT that this guy is going to add who is selling newspapers, who is selling that cement. That is an area of education, and we are already there. But VAT aside, you are talking about how do we broaden the tax base. There are already policy issues. John has mentioned the issue of the $3 per kilogram. We have argued that that is wrong from the time it came a few years back. You don't want to begin valuing used clothes by kilograms. They have a value, and as you said, you can ascertain that value. But government wanted to protect the local industry using a wrong policy. 
Because the cost of producing a T-shirt in Uganda, that T-shirt is going to be 15 to 20,000 by the time you get it done off the factory. You are already far above the people who actually put on the Mivumba. So you cannot expect them to move to that level. As uh, Professor Sarah rightly put it, they are looking for the cheapest. If you go downtown, we walk water, biri biri, biri biri, we walk water. Now that guy is not going to buy a Ugandan-made product. You are only punishing him by adding that extra twelve thousand per kilo of clothes. You are not going to promote the local industry. We need to understand that, and that tax needs to go back to value and not to weight. That should be sorted out there. Now, talking about that trade in the customs, I was looking at the figures. Every most of the goods if not all of them, by ESC policy, East African Community Policy, that come from the members should not be taxed. Ten years ago, we were importing goods worth about $46 million from Tanzania. Last year, 2023, we imported goods worth $1.2 billion from Tanzania. John can't tax that by policy. How are we going to replace that customs that has gone out? That same 10 years ago, we were importing goods worth 1.2 billion from India. That you could tax. If they come from India, you can tax. If they come from Tanzania, you can't tax. Now, you're not going to replace that whole loss in revenue, customs, by domestic taxes, without causing injury to everybody within the local system. We've got to address those issues and say, now that this is the reality, we wanted, and former President Chikwete was here, saying, let's do more of this. And I want to believe when these taxes came in 15 years ago, he was more or less the president. So he was seeing where we are going. So what is it that Tanzania has done to really increase the sales into Uganda? And Uganda hasn't increased its sales into Tanzania. Because at this point, you can only benefit by having your manufacturers increase their production and sales to the region. Then you pick the tax on the manufacturers, corporation tax excise duties and other taxes, because your customs is gone. Now we have lost both customs and we have lost both corporation tax. How are we going to replace? Those are issues that are beyond IFRIS, and I don't want IFRIS conversations and VAT to divert us from a bigger challenge on how do we raise the 31 trillion <coughs> we need for the next year. There are significant economy-wide issues. I've been looking at inventories uh, in factories. Inventories really, the factory has invested. But as he said, many of them haven't recovered from COVID. If you look at the difference between 2019 and 2020, and then 2022-23, the inventories, that's the investment factories have made and failed to pass on into the market, has increased by 33%. In real terms, removing the issue of prices which can vary by other reasons. That is a significant pain on the industries. And remember their cost on the bank loans have gone up, partly because of monetary policy. Our monetary policy has been increasing interest rates. This is affecting both new borrowers and old borrowers. And I was working out numbers with my students. I said, if you borrowed two billion three years ago at an interest rate of 19, and that rate has gone up to 23% over the last three years because of so many reasons, you needed 73 million per day, I mean per month, to pay back that loan. Now you need 77 million a month. On a loan that is not new, but simply because monetary policy has been pushing interest rates up, fiscal policy has been pushing interest rates up. Now for this business which now has to meet this new cost, tariffs have gone up, labor costs are up, transport costs are up, John comes in. This guy is going to look at John as the only intruder who is not adding value to his process. Because if he doesn't pay his loan, <laughs> the bank is going to foreclose. If you don't pay your laborers, your suppliers of inputs, water, electricity, rent, you are out of business. So this guy will only survive by under declaration. He's really not trying to dodge taxes. He's saying, how do I remain alive mm. in this business? Now, you have to look into that space and say it is more than just tax policy. It is also about how we are encroaching on businesses by the current restrictive monetary policy. And I want to see Bank of Uganda begin to look at the broad objectives of monetary policy. Not just to say I'm fighting inflation. One way of fighting inflation is to actually allow businesses to perform. 
these inventories, if they produce goods and services out on the market, prices would go down. So how do we broaden the conversations around monetary policy? How do we broaden the conversations on fiscal policy? What are we spending on? Is it going to trigger demand for the businesses? So the conversation on tax cannot be divorced from the broader conversation on how are we managing the economic space. I'm arguing for an increase of a threshold. It is long since we raised the threshold, 235. We should be going maybe to 240. You may lose some margin of about 17,000 in terms of pay. But remember, these are people who are going to be consuming. So you recover it at 18% in terms of when they go to do consumption taxes. So the net loss and gain there, but the bigger benefit on making sure businesses now have greater sales can actually overwrite what you may think is your loss on pay. Now, that analysis, we haven't walked into it, but we need to get into that broader conversation, talking about how do we deepen and broaden the tax base. First of all, how do we strengthen the taxpayers, both households and businesses. Businesses looking at manufacturers and the traders. That conversation is still blank, we are all simply going and saying, this swamp must give us more water. Mm. But the swamp is dry. Talk to National Water and Sewerage Corporation, why did they shift to Katosi? The lake is here in, in, in Gaba. But they had to go to Katosi because clean water was no longer here. So we also need to come back and say, we need more taxes. But we should not do it at the expense of households, manufacturers, and the traders. Are our other policies strengthening them? so that we can say, now we have offered you this service, can we pay the tax? And they will be willing to pay. So for me, that conversation of, are we on the right track in the broader sense of economic policy management? I think we have issues there before we even just zoom in on tax. And I'm going to come back to that part where you talked about economic policy management. Mr. Walgembe, yes. uh, 31 trillion is what <laughs> the Commissioner General has to raise come the next financial year. Yes. And when you look at especially a statistic that came from Tuaweza and URA September 2022, 55% mm. of businesses were dying because of three reasons. Mm. High taxes, high costs of input, and COVID-19. Mm. How do we strike a balance that businesses are thriving, but also taxes, we are compliant? Mm. Okay, first of all, we need to, um, as I said, we need to be concerned about the survival of businesses. And sometimes I feel that URA is saying, my task is to collect uh, all other questions. Please ask other people, which in, in, in theory is correct. But you know, from a business perspective, they want to feel that empathy. If I was, for instance, I would want to interrogate, how many businesses did I have on my tax register? in 2019 that are no longer there. Where are they? What happened? What can we do? Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, and if they had been paying tax consistently, say for 10 to 20 years, and because of COVID they went under, you know, to, can we give them some kind of special priority, for instance, under UDP, you know? So this is you are now actively pushing to say, this is, this is our taxpayer, they hit hard times, but how can we help resurrect them using the available government programs? You know, instead of just saying, oh, sorry, you, you, you collapse, no problem. See you later, we'll go to the next person. So for me, that, that kind of ability to, target, to be targeted, because what I see with support programs is that we want, there's, there's a certain group of businesses that are going to pay tax. These are mainly the small, the medium, and some large businesses. But then you find that a lot of support programs are targeting, if you look, for instance, as PDM, it's mm. a very good program, but it's targeting people who are outside the money economy, which is not bad from a demand perspective, but in terms of tax, it's going to take a very long time to bring any form of dividends. So how can we keep a certain balance so that as we invest money in the bottom of the pyramid, we also invest in these people who are actually bringing money and are paying and are paying tax. The other issue is that we need to support taxpayers to pay, not just general tax education, but actual support. And I like the fact that URA now is taking the direction of business centers, of hand holding. This is extremely important because it reduces the cost 
for businesses. It means that it's easier. For, instead of me paying a consultant, an accountant, if I can go to a business support center that you are errands, it's much easier for me and I can, I can be better able to, to comply. Then we should also look at the constraints. I already said, if we are saying we want to go digital, how do we ensure that we remove some of the impediments? And I'm very much against the tax that we have on gadgets. You know, digital is now critical, D taxes on data, you know. So we kind of compare, we say, you know, if we remove tax on data, we can recoup it through more people paying tax, you know, through IFRIS and, 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 and these other things. So it's that a kind of analysis that I would want us to say. And then there's the issue of uh, the formalization agenda. I think this is also an area where we need to work very closely. And not just with URA, but also with government. We've been talking to the private sector, the government unit of the Ministry of Finance. How do we have more businesses formalized? Uh, and how do we support them on that formalized? Because it's one thing registering and getting it in. It's another remaining compliant. Okay? So how do we ensure that we, the stakeholders in this space, are able to support these SMEs to grow? Unfortunately, uh, the, there's a trend now where Government only responds to pressure. You know? It's like someone who goes to a bank and shouts the first time, and then the bank manager calls him, let me talk to your gentleman, they serve him. It means other people <laughs> also start shouting, because they say, OK, for us, we make lines, and people don't take us seriously. So now I think that traders have also understood that if you don't say, we are closing our shops, because now you can see the panic and the meetings that have been held with these traders. These are the businesses that have been taking the formal petitions, policy positions, they are completely ignored. So I think as we try to put out these fires, we should also be careful so that we don't incentivize this kind of behavior going, going forward. Now, I also need to comment on the issue of which they brought. Because my concern, and you know, we represent SMEs. I've talked about the issue of IFRIS. Now, there are issues where I disagree with some of the positions that have been taken by our colleagues. The first one is on the issue of the 35% tax. And we must make it very clear. That is a position of the EAC. They have placed, they have introduced a fourth band to ensure that we grow the cotton and textile sector in Uganda. We did an analysis myself, found that this sector alone can create four to five million jobs in this country. If a country is to industrialize, very rarely will it grow without first investing in this sector. And by the way, we are not just talking about using our homegrown cotton. We are talking about an active apparel sector. So anyone who is sitting there, and I heard people arguing that these Chinese, they come and set up workshops. If they are setting up workshops and they are, and they are paying import duty of 25%, you do the same. It's common sense. Why do you bring a complete shirt and pay 35% import duty? Yet you can bring a collar and this and this, and then you put them together. And, you know, so we must teach our people that. So now, if you go and see the president and tell him, please reverse this, what will happen? He'll summon the Kenyan president, he'll summon the council of ministers, and say, you people, we had an urgent meeting, you need to go back to the three-band structure. It can't happen. So there are things where we must be clear and say, for, for future prosperity. Of course, you can't just be a supermarket importing clothes from all these countries, perpetually. You know? But let me ask. So uh, for uh, me, on that issue... Dr. Uh, Mumza raised the question and, and said, like when you walk downtown, yes. the man is telling you, biddy, biddy. And then the, what was the cost of a no, shirt? No, we cannot... So this is the other issue. We cannot be, be, as a country, a dumping ground for used clothes from the U.S. Do you know how many jobs the U.S makes from these used clothes just for Uganda, 30,000 jobs. No, 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 I can't, in this, in that sector alone, I cannot agree with that kind of position. I am opposed to people saying we are importing clothes, used clothes, and the, these clothes are just collected and dumped here now. So for, on, the, on that one, I would, I would completely di disagree with our colleagues and say, we must have a strategy of industrialization that's well thought through and one of the sectors that can help us to thrive. Because low-level manufacturing now is moving away from China. It's going to Vietnam. It's going to all these countries. And Africa can position itself well. Bangladesh has a thriving apparel sector, 4 million jobs. They have no cotton. They import the material. They make products and they sell. 
So if we want to create jobs, and if we don't want to export our young people to the Middle East to, to start working in households, this is one sector we can look at and develop. Now, the challenge I have is that after you've put barriers, you don't engage in act, you don't have a program, because we need to have an actual program where we are supporting. Look at the Chiembe people, for instance. I'll give you the Chiembe people. Why should a private business person set up a mall for these tailors and so on? Government can set up these common user facilities and so on, and people pay cheap, you know? Not that government is competing, but it's the same methodology with industrial parks. Because if government is providing free land and so on, investors can also do the same to catalyze particular sectors. So that's the, the, the second issue where I'm, I'm diverging with my colleagues. The other is on the issue of these Chinese investors, okay, not just Chinese, but foreign investors who dominate the entire value chain. So someone is a manufacturer, is a transporter, is a wholesaler, is a retailer. Now, this is something that you are, and I think, when these things come, I see you are also absorbing a lot of things that are not their responsibility. They should be saying, oh, this is not our issue. Please go and tackle it with other. URA's issue is IFRIS and VAT. But the other issues are just generic issues that need to be tackled by other entities. That is an issue of competition. We are talking about the Competition Act and law that was recently passed. How do we operationalize it? There are no regulations at the moment. We, f we refuse to set up a commission. You see, but this issue of fair competition, because if you're saying we are going into a market-based economy, then it means there must be an umpire. Okay? In our case, you cannot have one person monopolize the entire value. You say no, if you're a manufacturer, please allow other SMEs to also benefit from. If you go to India, I cannot set up a shop in India. As an investor, I cannot go and get an investment permit. Even in South Africa, I cannot go and say I'm going to engage in retail business as an investor. So if countries are able to ring fence certain parts of the value chain to ensure that their locals are able to thrive. So on those two areas, I diverge from the position that my colleagues have taken. On the issue of IFRIS, as I earlier mentioned, it's an issue of education, 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 and hand-holding, and going so and elect. The Commissioner Gen General saying, we can go slow in some areas. I agree. If this is not new, it has been here since 2019. Let us go slow as people pick up and so on. Let us go slow. Let's not rush so that people are able to appreciate it. No, no, no. I, I don't agree with stop. These people who are saying we stop if are not serious. Because <laughs> you, Rwanda has if Kenya, in fact, for Kenya, it's not just VAT registered tax, but everybody now in Kenya is supposed to use IFRIS. So in any case, Uganda is better than Kenya. So for you to say that we stop IFRIS in Uganda, there's no way the IMF can accept that because the IMF or World Bank are giving us money and they're saying, what's your contribution? Then you say we have stopped IFRIS. I, I, I don't support that position. What I'm saying is we need to do it in a cleaner, smarter way. Let's not be confrontational. Let's remove this unnecessary pressure on clients. Bring your receipt, da, 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 da. Let's educate, let's give people time to adjust. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor, let me come to you. If the, <laughs> if, if, if the assumption or whatever has been alluded to that the president would meet them on Friday, what would you advise him in such a scenario? To advise to the, pres the president or the people? The president to address these people. Wow, <laughs> that's a difficult one. It depends on what they are going to to raise. The, the issues are here. The issues, yes, I've seen those issues. I think what he would do, advise them, I think one, he should tell them about the benefits of documentation in uh, taxation or in tax compliance, because this whole battle is about documentation. Some people are under-declaring, some people are over-declaring, some people are declaring, but they fear they will be overtaxed. So documentation is very, very important. But I would also want, you know, I, I, when you talk to people, and this was before even the strike, like two years ago, my friend opened up a certain kind of business, and I asked how the business was thriving, and we, we had a long chat about the costs of doing business. And this person told me, you know, in Uganda, if you do not evade tax, you cannot thrive. And I think it's one thing URA has to help us. That's why many of us, even 
because when you have something small, you cannot even register it, you cannot even share it on Facebook because you don't know which tax person is looking at. And so, if you don't pay tax, you do not thrive. Is that true? Isn't it true? We don't know. <laughs> The, I mean, if you don't, <laughs> yeah, but no, I think the question was, if you don't dodge taxes, you cannot survive. So that is a question you need to answer. The other thing we've had is the cost of doing business in Uganda is higher than in many other countries. Mm, and the true. example they always give us is VAT in Uganda is 18%, VAT in Nigeria is 6.7%. What is the difference? And uh, what lessons do we get? How come they charge 6.7%? Are they better than us? Are they worse? Although from the little we hear is that it's one of now the biggest economies in Africa now. And I don't know if it's just because of land mass and people, but uh, why do they have a VAT of 6.7% and uh, yet we are paying 18%? So I know the East African region has its own challenges and standardizes according to different things. So if the president met them on, on a f what is it, Friday? Friday. Yes, one, <laughs> if I was to advise him, I would advise him to encourage them to go back and work, but also to promise to look into their things because they have genuine concerns. And these genuine concerns have evolved over a longer period of time. They have a whole history of, as Dr. Mahomza said, those who collect the tax, you don't know whether they are wiring it, so that could be a problem, and that now comes back to IFRIS. Let them be encouraged to adapt to IFRIS, but let there be time for training and for compliance, and uh, let there be incentives for rewards for compliance for some people. Of course, you talked about if you've been overtaxed, you can get a refund, but what is a reward for someone who has over complied. I know mm. for, yeah, for a long time, I think those of us, who, and this time we're not discussing VAT, these other taxes, they say, oh, Makere is one of the best, the, the biggest taxpayers. But then you don't see anything that comes out of, of, of that. So, what is the benefit? Uh, of course, we have a big, we are heavily state funded and we have a big staffing. So, Basically, I think the other thing I would expect him to tell them is to look at the whole ecosystem of things and the political economy of things. I would expect, or I would request that he makes us all appreciate what the country is like. Uh, I think also for, if they also hear it from him what the taxes are doing, it would clear this thing that our taxes are going to waste. And that requires both URA and Minister of Finance and Economic Planning telling people what actually the taxes in Uganda do, okay? Because for us in Kampala, it's possible to just see ourselves and see that's where the whole country is about. But the country is broader than that. Mm. And that's why we have the 31 trillion we, we have to find. So the needs of the state are more, and genuine needs. So, so if you can tell, encourage them to go back and work, encourage them, okay, tell them about the benefits of IFRIS, because you know normally when people hear things from Mose, it's different from when they hear them from the Commissioner General of URA, <laughs> somehow the feelings are different, but also give them the broader perspective of the ecosystem in which we are riding and the, the whole political economy of things. I think that would help. I know the, uh, the Commissioner General mentioned it, that he has had numerous engagements. Yes. How would URA approach this trade as different? Because approach seems to be one of the things that they defer. Mm. How would they approach them differently to bring them on board? I think there's one thing he said, which we shouldn't miss, or which I would appreciate, that now there's, there are business centers for hand-holding. Yes. Let the first time people engage with URA not be enforcement. But if there is this business center there where someone can go and ask a question and where they can be hand-holding, that's one. The other thing he said which would be very important is that the apps are on the phone. And I imagine there's more information. Mm. If you, there's normally called QA, frequently that's FAQs. Mm -hmm. yeah, so what are the FAQs and what are there? Someone also raised the question, will it be in different languages? Because we cannot assume everyone in trade is that. So mm. URA should provide that. But the other thing I would love to see is URA explain what should happen where. 
So if URA has charged, I don't know if the example Dr. Mhumza gave, someone has bought a bag of cement. So should this person have added VAT as he's selling it in Boyogedere? And if not, should the one who is taxing be free to ask mm. the other person to pay for the VAT? Because maybe it's a small thing, she bought only five bags of cement from downtown. Added, no, no, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000. So here, this is where you need information because as a trader, and I bought a bag at 35 to where you're getting it, mm. do I add on 18% or has that already been paid at the time I purchased? So now I'm only adding on transport costs. So there are all those things which are not clear. So let this information be available because if you don't make it available, people are exposed to abuse by other people. And this is where you find every government entity wants to charge tax on a trader. And recently, I think there, were, there was a ruling on how to reduce some of these things. But you see the local government wants to tax the, I mean, there's the trading license, then there is the other. So there's a lot of things that people have to pay. So it is all boils down to information. It all boils down to handholding and the... And more engagements, which are not just in times like this, <laughs> more engagements where, where we are not quarreling, I think would be a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Holgenbe, uh, yes. my, my last question before we get into the segment of uh, parting shots. You said something that really caught me uh, when someone says, I know this is for this other ministry, this is for this MDA, this is for URA, or when something comes to URA and says, I know that's a ministry of trade. Mm -hmm. How do you bring that integration? Mm. To be able to answer and focus on that one SME and say, you know what, all guns from this MDA, this ministry, URA, let's help this business. Not to die, but to thrive. Uh, you know, globally, they used to have what they call, the World Bank used to do what they call uh, the doing business survey. That would say how we would compare different countries, how easy is it to run a small business. They would look at... How is, how easy is it to resolve a commercial dispute? How, how long does, how many steps does it take to register a business? How long does it take to get land and, and, and so on? Now, I think that was stopped, but I think as a country, we need to have our own index that shows how we facilitate business. Now, a lot of thinking within government institutions is that they are the bosses, you know, never mind that we call them civil servants. Hmm. But in their mind, they think that they are civil bosses, you see. Now, the, they need to appreciate that at the end of that day, it is this SME, it is this citizen who pays the tax. And therefore, I should do my bit to ensure that that person uh, is supported to grow and to thrive, you see. And I think that is where we want to say, let us reduce unnecessary bureaucracy and red tape for businesses, see? Because today you are able to go and is enforcing IFRIS, tomorrow UNBS will say, well, you have paid tax using IFRIS, but we have discovered that the goods on which you paid IFRIS are substandard. Mm -hmm. So okay, now why do I have to first pay tax for you to discover, you know, that they are uh, substandard and so on? So that coordination in government, I think, needs to be stronger. And most important, that we need to show value. And I, some, a lot of taxpayers are asking this question, but what does our money do? You know? And that's a valid uh, question. How do we explain? And there's good reason to say your taxes. I move across the country. And sometimes you find very nice uh, roads in you know, all these places. You go to Bundivujo, you go to the north and stuff. You go up country and you find a, a health center, you find a vocational center and so on. How do we show that? some of the money that you collect has been used to do these things. Of course, Kampala is a bit of a problem, because sometimes you go to Kampala, you find that certain roads are worse than in, you go to Makere, find that there's a road that is worse <laughs> than in Karamoj. Then you wonder, <laughs> if, <laughs> if most taxes are being collected from Kampala, Wakiso, Mukona, and so on, why don't we ensure that we also make sure that people see value? Uh, through their taxes. If you go to an industry area where businesses are, make sure the roads are done, there are lights and so on. I know that's not your as mandate, but you are a can advise. I think they have an advisory role within the law. They can advise government and say, to make our life easy, hmm? make the roads in Kampala so that taxpayers feel that there's some, there's some value that they are getting. 
to make our life easy, make sure that the businesses that are paying tax are supported in this and that. And I'm happy with this idea of the centers because that's one way in which you give back to business. As you say, yes, you're giving us taxes, but we are willing to help you to make your life easy as you run your business and as you, and as you pay tax. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mumza, if the population in Kampala, and as uh, Mr. Holgimba said, the last census showed people who sleep here 1.5. During the day, we are close to 4.5. And someone has sent a message and said, Kampala is just for surviving and kuiriba. Nonya zarero. How do we bring nonya zarero into this tax bracket? You might actually be doing them a favor not even to think of bringing them into the tax bracket. Let them just first exist mm -hmm. and, survive. and survive, like they have mentioned. And that's why I have a difference with uh, my colleague Walgembe. <laughs> the, the Bureau of Statistics information shows us that majority of Ugandans, even within Kampala, their monthly income is 90,000, 120, 150,000 a month. So literally that person has 5,000 to spend per day. This is a household head. So he has a family of even if you say four children and a spouse, that already makes them six. Oh. So the fellow is literally spending seven to 800 shillings on each member of that household per day. Oh. Do you want to develop your textile industry on such a population? Why don't they first survive? For you to begin imposing taxes on the cheap clothing that they can have, to manage their 800, to buy food, pay rent, medical, and all sorts of other costs, data, you know, etc. To survive, you have to let go and say, for now, as for the textile industry, the Mivumba will do. But where else can I make my money? to build my exports because you can either, when others are tapping into your market, you also can tap into their markets. We have a lot of minerals and we can develop the mining sector, export and bring in the money here. That is another way you can get your balance of payments sorted out. As I indicated, Tanzania over the last 10 years has increased its exports to Uganda from less than 50 million to over a billion dollars. What have they done? And this does not include Mivumba. Because those used clothes are not coming from Tanzania. So you can't blame most of these things. But first of all, a Uganda needs to be dressed. Mm. So before you subject them to your local textile industry, increase their household incomes, which answers your question. Some of these people, we must make sure the government programs we have done are actually translating into household incomes rising. A lot of these programs have not been speaking to that. They have done in rhetoric and politics. But in reality, we have not shifted these households to that level. 8.3 million households in Uganda are below 3,800 per day. What have we done ourselves? And now we have reached a level where taxes can no longer even speak to service delivery. The dilemma we are saying on how do we pay taxes and demand some service is out of the question for us because of debt. You have a domestic debt in the coming year that is going to be costing us 20 trillion in that particular year. Now, this is interest payment and debt refinancing. It's not even speaking to service delivery in that particular year. It's really a backlog of issues that you have carried along. I'm reading information from the Ministry of Finance, the report they gave us on performance of the economy for March. Between July and up to March, we have borrowed from the domestic market about 12 trillion already. Of that, 7.2, 7.3 trillion was simply to manage the debt, not even to improve the service. Only about 4.7 trillion was left to improve service delivery. And the service delivery here, you're talking about wages that you must pay, security personnel who need to do their work to keep us safe, Maybe paying off teachers and a few other things. You're not even speaking of your road that you're talking about. Mm. Now, you have reached a level where debt is making sure you are unable to improve even your service, even for your taxpayer. So this tension is going to increase. And what do people wake up seeing in the morning? People want to 
fatten their own lives, the best cars, the flying abroad. And, uh, so I'm, I'm happy with what Parliament is doing on restructuring, but we have said let that be extended across the entire government. This fleet of things and expensive government rent and all elsewhere needs to come down so that we can begin to increase the fiscal space for government to have some balances to address the very core issues that touch the population, but also empower us to grow the economy. So ultimately, we must first make sure our programs, interventions, and the way we are spending is increasing household incomes. If not, is at least helping households not to spend their little income on certain things. If you look at the amount of money each household is spending on education and health, things that are supposed to be free, if they were free, that money will be retained with the household. That household can now be expected to buy a, a cloth made in Uganda. But as of now, for them to survive, buy food, pay rent, move around, pay school fees, and treat themselves, Muvumba will cover the other clothing component. So for me, we have to come back and rethink how are we addressing household income strategies. We have talked, we have put in the National Development Plan, the reality over the last 20 years does not be speaking to what we want to see or what we have been saying. How do we fix that? And then these people will come and pay taxes. Thank you very much. Lastly, uh, Mr. Commissioner General, what's the lifespan of IFRIS, first and foremost? And also, Mr. Walgembe, there was a red flag he lifted there when he said the Kenyans now IFRIS is to one individual. At what point does it reach the individual? <laughs> okay, hope, I think Mr. Walgembe was saying it was, we hope not. No, no, no. It was a red it's flag, so the question goes to the Commissioner General. Don't encourage him to <laughs> take us in that direction. <laughs> you are saying it's for all taxpayers, not just VAT registered. <laughs> Uh, and not just Kenya, everywhere. If you've traveled uh, abroad, uh, Europe, even here in Africa, South Africa, if you're a foreigner and you're just shopping and you buy some things with VAT, on your way out of the airport, you can get instant cash refund. They make it so difficult for you to get it. That's I what know. the law says. That's another but trick. But they ensure mm. they don't give it to that, you. That's <laughs> another trick. But, but it's possible. My, yes, I've also ever gotten mine. Told me you signed here since you seem to be going to live within the next six months. Yes. So I signed off the forms. Left Manchester in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. The tax offices were not open. Yes. They told me no problem. You drop it. You in pick it. it from Amsterdam. Mm. Yes. So when I go to Amsterdam, I speak to those questions. They mm. simply said, Oh, you're going to Uganda. Do you need euros, dollars, or the pounds you paid? That's those right. were the only questions. That's right. And I got my money back. Came here and uh, you know. But it's so, not so South Africa. Uh, no, those ones are. <laughs> those <laughs> Africa, they will say, give us your, give us your bank details. We'll those send are Africans. It. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. what I wanted to say from this example, it is possible because of technologies like if yes. yes. We yes. can know what you've purchased, yes. what is your tax, and what is your refund instantly. Yeah. Mm. And Uganda cannot be out of the global uh, trend of things. This is our time to to get onto IFRIS and other technologies. So you asked what is the lifespan of, lifespan of IFRIS? Uh, what, what exactly do you mean? Because there are upgrades to it. The system. The system, oh, the system is upgrade. Mm. Well, and we're going to have challenges of it becoming obsolete. No, not at all. IFRIS is here to stay. We have it. We can only expand the rollout from VAT to other taxpayers. It is owned by you already. Yeah, to all businesses. Mm. It will become part of us. And one day, Uganda will be able to refund those two are who come in and shop. We refund them on their way out. So it is a technology for now and the future, and it has no lifetime. But let me very quickly comment on very key issues that came through. Tax education and engagement, broadening the channels and the languages, we are at that. Mm. Our web portal, URA, which is www.ura.org, geo.ug. If you visit our web portal today, you will see the improvement on it. You can have it in any language. So you go there, you pick Luganda, it will put everything on taxation in Luganda. You want to pick Chinese, you'll pick everything in Chinese. So we're already doing multiple communication on our main web portal. But we're also translating this into other documents. So we have some flyers in Luganda, we have some flyers in uh, uh, 
Luo and so many. So we are we are deliberate on engaging and communicating to the wider uh, communities in Uganda. Number two, what do you do for the struggling businesses? We are really very alert to the fact that businesses are struggling. The impact of COVID-19, the impact of uh, these global wars and many other challenges have affected our businesses. So what are we doing to support? One of the things we allowed for the first time, which is creating a problem for us, but we must do it to support businesses, is to allow payments in installments. We never used to do this, especially for imports. Those ones you would pay cash. By the time you import the car, you should have enough taxes. But from the time of COVID, we got guidance from the Ministry of Finance, and we started relaxing on some of those terms. So if you have a struggle to raise all the amount of tax required of you, even at importation, and later on domestic taxes, please approach us. We can allow you to pay in installments so that as you make money, you pay. You don't have to go and uh, borrow at very high interest rate. Of course, any unpaid tax attracts some interest. That is in the law. But our interest is much smaller than Kafuna money. So you can, you can pay small interest, but pay in installments. What are we doing? And, and of course, the tax waivers. These laws behind tax waiving, if you remember, last year we had a law which was allowing all penalty and interest to be waived mm. as long as you pay principal. We have been supportive of these laws because we want to reduce the burden on businesses. Now, last year that law expired. It was in TPC 40D. We have approached Parliament asking for an extension, and we hope this will come through. So anybody who still owes a big tax liability, just focus on raising your principal tax. Once we have a new law coming through in the next financial year, we'll have another six months window to clear this. What are we doing now beyond supporting the struggling uh, taxpayers? What are we doing now to, to, to appreciate and promote those who comply? We have a number of incentives in place. One of these is withholding tax exemption. And we are going to publish a, a document asking people to express interest. If you know that you file on time, you pay your taxes on time, you have not been subject to an investigative tax audit, you are compliant, please apply for that exemption. And this makes a big relief for cash flow because withholding tax of 6% on every transaction, every purchase you make is significant amount. We are saying if you're a compliant taxpayer, we will not be charging you this withholding tax 6%, even at importation mm. or local purchases. We'll wait for you to do your returns at the end of the year, and you will pay your income tax at once. Because withholding tax is income tax paid in advance. Mm. The other incentive is issuance of TCCs, uh, tax compliance certificates. These ones, you need them for any form of bidding, looking for business. If you're a compliant taxpayer, just go on our portal, apply for your TCC, you'll have it in instantly. Because we, there we will automatically tick the boxes. So you don't have to come to URA, you find businesses rushing to URA to get the TCC. Sometimes they are late in traffic jam, they go to take the tender, they tell them we have closed. We have removed that bottleneck for the compliant taxpayers. You'll get it instantly without interfacing anybody at URA. But even those who are struggling, you have a tax liability, you've been a subject of audit, and therefore you are not that compliant. The general message we are giving to URA staff and our teams across the country, please allow to facilitate businesses to do the bidding, to do the business. That is when they'll get money to pay you. So even those who owe, we give you a TCC, but on some conditions. We say, okay, commit. We are giving you this, you have debts, but can you commit to a payment plan? Once you pay, then it becomes automatic. Of course, we have something we call authorized economic operators for the people who import. That is a customs program. You import your things without any delays. They call it the blue channel. You pass through the blue channel uh, or the green channel. You get your things cleared, and we shall audit you later. Did what you say on paper was actually what you brought in because you are a compliant taxpayer. We have many, many programs, among other things. What are we doing now to support businesses going forward? I'm happy you have all appreciated the tax service centers. We started with CBD Kampala. We will, explore, we will expand this to all other regions. 
just to handhold. Uh, we will increase our channels of communication. We are now busy printing flyers on IFRIS, on VAT. We want people to understand. And we will expand uh, our foot uh, or, or, or presence on these channels. That's why I'm here, Timothy, mm. for the first time. <laughs> I, I have been concentrating one. on other things, mm. but I'm going to come again and again, so please allow me. Now, let me speak about one or two other things. We, out of these initiatives and use of technology, we have expanded our taxpayer register from 1.7 million taxpayers in 2020 to now 4.2 million taxpayers. Mm. This is a significant growth on our register. However, most of these are new taxpayers. We get them through the use of technology. We need to handhold them, understand their businesses so that they can make their full contribution. The other element, and this was raised by, by, by uh, uh, Professor, can you not dodge taxes and survive in Uganda? Mm -hmm. Where there is non-compliance that is dominant and without any initiatives to check, compliant taxpayers must go down. Why? Because the non-compliant take advantage to undercut their prices and sell them. Mm -hmm. So technologies like IFRIS, is to level the playing field. So I'm very optimistic that going forward, compliant taxpayers will thrive because we're adopting technology to protect them. That's Lisa. Finally, mm. uh, but uh, Timothy, you asked me many questions. So <laughs> do I dodge <laughs> these questions? And Can I speak very briefly? Can he also tell because us she also that? talked about VAT. Why do we have to be at 18 when Nigeria is, is at six? seven? Mm. This is a game of numbers. I told you VAT is a consumption tax. Mm. What's the population of Nigeria? More than 200 million. Absolutely. <laughs> About 200, maybe and 20 or 30. Mm. Four times our population. Their VAT should be like a porter. Because consumers pay the VAT. So we can talk about the rate. We can talk about the threshold. These are issues to discuss. But VAT is very important to uphold. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, colleagues, and before I want to thank all the part panelists. Conclude, yes. Briefly, if mm. someone is aggrieved like up country, where do they report? If you are aggrieved, we have two uh, different uh, complaints. One, there is an issue relating to poor handling by our staff. Either they are rude to you, or they, are, they want to, to, to ask for a bribe to help you, yeah. whatever it is. We have a whole unit of compliance, mm. staff compliance, staff discipline, headed by an assistant commissioner. His name is called James Sabola. I need the numbers to read them before I leave here. We have 24-hour uh, numbers where you can lodge this complaint. Please reach to us if it is an issue of that. If it is an issue of being overassessed, mm -hmm. it is your right as a taxpayer. Because of absence of technology, I must admit that some of our assessments are, are, are based on some assumptions. They are not very accurate. So as a taxpayer, it is your right that if you're not happy with the tax assessment, object. And to object, go to our web portal, and you say you have given me this assessment, I disagree with it. And we must review your objection and give you a response within, uh, within, within I think, 45 days. Mm. And then... We will either uphold the, the assessment if we have reasons to, or we shall vacate it if you are not. Okay. And even if you are not happy with the objection decision, you can appeal to ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Okay. That will be an independent team. They will look at your case. And finally, if you don't get justice, go to the Tax Appeals Tribunal, an independent adjudicator, and then you will decide. Can I briefly comment, Timothy, on policy issues? Because my boss, the minister, would have answered. In his absence, please let me say mm. these answers. One of the issues you raised was the foreigners dominating the market. And uh, my brother, Mr. Wargembe, referred to the Competition Act. This was signed into law February this year. Now the Minister of Trade is doing the regulations. Mm. Once the regulations are in place, they will sort out this issue of dominance or people being manufacturers and then being retailers and so on and so forth. Number two. Uh, that relates to policy. Uh, 
maybe this is not policy. I think that's what I wanted to say about policy. The other issue was on the local, protecting our local industries. I want to share with you a live example, because I was also under the impression that maybe everything made here will be expensive. As an organization, we are buying uniforms for our staff. And yes, we went out to source some tenders to buy these uniforms. And if we went by the quality and, 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 and the style of the uniform, we could have picked on, on an imported uniform. But in terms of price, the imported uniform was more expensive. 30,000 per piece, per one shirt, 30,000 more expensive than the locally manufactured. So I called my top management. I said, you people, the government of Uganda is promoting a policy of bubu. Buy Uganda, build Uganda. We are promoting import substitution. How can we make a decision to buy a finer looking shirt from an imported uh, supply when we can have our own? So we took a decision, we'll buy a local one. We will, it may not appear as smart. By the way, it's, it's a question of being committed to this. If we all buy these shirts, they will get better and better and better. So I fully agree with the submissions of my colleagues here. Let's build our country, Uganda, with one spirit. We will get to the quality that we want. Now, where we are as a nation is a very defining moment. And I want us to work together. This is why we will deliberately engage everybody who is willing to listen to us. The foreign support that we've been getting by way of donations and loans is diminishing for all the reasons we all understand. And in a way, every country has its own problems to carry. Our tax to GDP is at the bottom, 14%. It is below the average for sub-Sahara Africa. Africa average is 16%. Uganda, we are at 14 Dr. Fred has explained that most of the monies we collect go to debt servicing. How can we develop? There is no country which will develop when they are collecting less than 20% of their GDP. Mm -hmm. The tax burden for Uganda is 11.7%. In the ranking of the world, the countries of the world, we are number 140 out of 172 countries. So it is very, very clear that whatever we are contributing as tax, is small. It can not cause development. It cannot cause us to be economically independent. Therefore, the subject to engage on and discuss is how can we identify everybody that is playing a role in this, our economy, to contribute to their fair share of tax. And this is a subject that we cannot claim to have all the answers to, but engagement with our citizens, with the, the academia, with the leaders, will give us the right answers, and that is when we work together as a nation to build our country, Uganda. This demonstrations, striking, threats will not work. On the side of URA, we are ready to cooperate. The numbers. Let me read you the numbers. And I, the, 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 the number for staff compliance headed by Mr. Bola is 0772144. Zero seven five. Any complaint to do with staff discipline, raise it on this number. Alternatively, you can send an email to J. Abola. Abola is spelled as A B O L A at URA dot G O dot U G. Your issue will be handled expeditiously and in confidence. I thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Commissioner General. A lot of feedback coming through. I'll just pick two so that we can call it a morning. Uh, Arthur uh, Mukarazi from Kitende says, I, I appreciate the panel. I personally think a URA needs to do more awareness publicly to discuss these things. I have learned a lot and many people are arguing due to ignorance. Of course, those who are cheating are making more noise, but uh, for us who want to adopt uh, these issues are non-issues, and I would like to, to again say thank you, and VAT is a good thing. Well done. Uh, lastly, uh, the tax policy in Uganda system where collecting is turning into a garden of corruption. I bought items in Kenya worth $3.1 million. I'm being asked for tax of one point five in Busia. The type of goods are phone accessories only. Otherwise, I thank you for the program. Thank you very much, Frank from Mbara. 
And a lot of feedback has come through, and we really appreciate that. T Timothy, I forgot to mention the headline that was shocking. Can I clarify <laughs> that in half a second? Half a second. Half a second. This headline was saying Ugandans, Ugandan employees are going to be paying 58%. Percent. That was so wrong. The proposal under the bills that are being discussed now was saying that for a company which gives gifts to its workers, can they account for VAT on the gifts they give out? An example, if a company like Coca-Cola <coughs> wishes to contribute for the employee, Timothy, on his wedding, 100 crates of Coke, that will be no sale. But because VAT, as I explained earlier, you do VAT input, VAT output, the ingredients that made those 100 crates of Coke were in the VAT input. If you give it out as a donation and you don't account for the VAT, that VAT will be lost. So we are just saying, even for gifts to your staff, roofings, you want to give iron sheets to your workers or whatever it is, can you account for the VAT there? There is no additional 1% increment on the people paying 40%. I'm one of those paying 40% of tax. I know what it means. There will be no addition. And we thank those employees who sacrificed to pay that much. We are not adding a penny. Today there was another alarming one in the monitor that interest rates of the banks are going to go high. There is again no new load there. We are only saying when goods, when, 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 uh, when uh, assets are being disposed through an auction, can you account for the VAT? And can the VAT be collected by the one collecting this money from the auction? It could mm. be a bank, it could be an auctioneer, or whatever it is, we wanted to streamline that. So please, headlines. Let's improve what we communicate. It is far from the truth. I've seen these bills. Parliament will discuss them. The, the fine ones will come out. But if we send out these messages, it's to bias the public and cause a message that taxation is going out of hand. Thank okay. you very much. Professor Sarah, thank you very much. Mr. Wagembe, thank you very much. Dr. Mohums, as always, thank you very much. Commissioner General, thank you for coming through. Thank you. For you who have stood with us all day and the ones who are in the technical team to make sure today has happened, We'll end it this way. You can make money two ways. One, making more. Two, spending less. Good morning. Nyati Motion Pictures brings you to Copa Moja Toro segment. Follow the romance of an adventurous prince, Kaboyo Kasusun Kwanzi, who fell in love with a beautiful county. Toro Kingdom was carved out of Bonyoro Kitara. In 1830, King Nyamutukura. Akasindika omutabaniwe. Kaboyo Yehile Toro. Kamo Tungerifu Mumtuwekele Bukodo. I'm forming my own kingdom. Nyoro Naba Toro, basically, Mumtuwom. Tuko Pamoja, daily screenings at Ham Cinemax in Wandegea, Sunday 7th to 13th, April 2024. To get a ticket, call 0778-787-660. UBC, inspiring Uganda. Nyati Motion Pictures brings you to Copa Moja Toro segment. Follow the romantic tale of an adventurous prince, Kaboyo Kasusun Kwanzi, who fell in love with a beautiful county. Toro Kingdom was carved out of Bonyoro Kitara. In 1830, King Nyamutukura. Akasindika omutabaniwe. Kaboyo Yehile Toro. Kamo Tungerifu Mumtuwekele Bukodo. I'm forming my own kingdom. Nyoro Naba Toro, basically, Mumtuwom. Tuko Pamoja, daily screenings at Ham Cinemax in Wandegea, Sunday 7th to 13th, April 2024. To get a ticket, call 0778-787-660.
107.3 Kampala 96.9 Mbale 95.7 Jinja 98.6 Soroti You are all covered Sai Villa 